Welcome everyone and whatever time of the day it is for you. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, welcome to this webinar from Sports Sustainability International in collaboration with the 11th Hour Racing Team, which we will have. And it's my, my pleasure and my honor to, to leave the floor in a few minutes to, to renowned athletes, Damien, who will introduce himself, open sailing racing and former winner of the Ocean Race or the Volvo Ocean Race and Alexandra, two-time Paralympic medalist in sailing. The last one I think was in Rio 2016. So before we start the conversation about how both Damien and Alexandra have seen that and are seeing that the whole context and the whole approach to winning, both from the athlete as well as from an organization's point of view in, in sailing, but probably also world broadway sport, it's changing. And there's an interesting paradigm, paradigm that we want to discuss. Um, before that, let me just give you uh, a two-minute pitch um, about SENSI, about Sport and Sustainability International. You might be familiar with us. My name is Geert Hendricks. I'm one of the founding directors of Sport and Sustainability International and your host today. The short version is go to our website if you want to know more, but let me quickly talk you through a few things in two minutes. We're a global membership organization based in Geneva, Switzerland, and doing activities basically to work towards three big goals, one related to climate, the second one related to health, and the third one related to waste. Accelerating sustainability in and through sport is our, is our goal, is our mission. As I said, we're a membership organization, which means we have sport entities and non-sport entities that are member of SANSI. And it's really a range across different size and different type of organization from large one to smaller ones to professional athletes, as well as students that are involved. So here's just an overview of some of the uh, members of Sports Entertainment International. We're doing a variety of different things. We have been limited as well, like many of you in the last few months due to COVID, but our activities are clustered around two programs. One is football for climate, soccer for our friends from outside of Europe, where we really use the language of soccer, the language of football to uh, accelerate the debate and action around climate change. And the second one is a platform which we call SDG Sport Lab, closely linked to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals to really encourage and initiate and share concrete initiatives that use sport to contribute to the sustainable development goals. So that's a little bit about Sensi. Now, I would be really happy to, uh, to, please, to pass the floor to Alexandra and, and Damien. Damien, if you can, uh, can switch on your camera as well, it would be great uh, so that we can, uh, we can see you. Uh, who will take us through a little bit of their journey and, and how sustainability plays a role in a lot of the things that they are doing. So Alexandra, um, Damien, the floor is yours. Hey, hi everybody. Uh, nice to see people from all over the world uh, today and it's uh, really a pleasure to, to be here. Damien and I have only really gotten to know each other um, through putting together this uh, webinar so uh, it's a really great opportunity to chat to you all. Um, so to start it all off really uh, it was sort of what are our backgrounds and um, as you can see I have a large selection of photos here of me from way back when. Uh, I was born and grew up in Jamaica. Um, I've always had a really deep love for the sea, but sailing is not a big sport in, in Jamaica. Um, I think it's still mainly because also a lot of people don't swim, but it's also because our relationship with, with the ocean is, is, is probably actually more land focused as a people. And also sailing is quite an expensive sport. Um, I was always super competitive. I came out of the womb competitive. So um, so very much the, the concept of, of winning and, and, uh, and competition has been really central to my existence. Uh, um, as you can see from the second, the middle photograph, I, I rode horses because I grew up in, in the countryside and Damien and I were talking yesterday because his daughter's become obsessed with horses and, and around about then that was my major obsessional period of horses but I competed a lot and, um, and I guess really nature has been central to everything um in my life when i look back and at the moment i know a lot of us are looking back at you know and really trying to look at what's what's core to us and for me nature and kind of understanding it 
the science behind it. Um, the photo on the right is me watching coconuts get cut, but I was like intrigued by um, by how our gardener used to do it. And and I think, uh, yeah, the science, the design, um, you know, and and just being able to be outside all of my childhood was really key. And then when I was um, 12 years old, I, I moved to England and um, and I had, and for boarding school. And then the year after that, I had my diving accident, which is how I kind of really engaged with sailing in, in all honesty. And um, about two months after I had my diving accident, I was uh, rehabbing in, in the US in Miami. And I went sailing for the first time uh, with Shake a Leg, which is a, a sailing uh, and educational facility in Florida, um, which funny enough, throughout my Paralympic career, I then revisited for a competition every year. So, so that's really where kind of my, the, the start of my environmental journey kind of came from. And then I decided that actually my deep love for nature and for science, that I would study biology and natural sciences at university, and then went on to do environmental science. Um, and, and that's kind of where the base of all of that has come from for me. So Damien, why don't you tell us a bit about you and how, how you managed to get into sailing? Thanks, thanks Alexandra. Can you guys hear me okay? I'm just trying to, uh, Garrett, I'm just trying to click forward on the slide. Um, it's funny, I... Oh, you're getting pretty have, we, have, you got it? Have, we, have you got us there, Garrett, with the next slide? There we go. So um, I think we'll probably find that in fact, at least we've discovered in the last couple of weeks that we've had fairly similar, um, if what, if parallel kind of routes. So um, it's been very nice to meet Alexandra, and, and um, there's been a lot of um, similarities, I think, which um, which will become apparent. And uh, so I grew up in Southwest Ireland, and um, uh, on in and around the water. Um, and as they say that, you know, the apple doesn't drop far from the tree and the, on the right hand side, that's my, uh, that's my um, mother's father. So my granddad who uh, racing boats and out of West Kirby and on the world and um, in the Merseyside area. And uh, when my mom and dad moved to Ireland and had two kids, um, uh, we ended up having boxes of old trophies in the attic and um, so rummaging through those trophies um, kind of wondering what they were and finding old sailing knives was uh, somehow I guess kind of rubbed off in me. Um, bottom left hand there is is actually my son but um, uh, on the left hand side but uh, he's at a sailing school, a windsurfing school that I grew up working in and learning to sail in. Uh, we built our own surfboards and and um, and uh, worked all summer with uh, with the local community and with uh, with holiday makers, and so that was really our lives on in and around the water. And uh, uh, I think you know the thing that stands out for me is with regards to the water and sailing in particular is it's uh, it's such a diverse um, arena. It's it's it offers so many opportunities. It's very much a multi generational sport. Um, it's a sport for all, and and I like to consider that it's not just a sport, or maybe even originally it wasn't a sport. Um, the type of sailing that I grew up in was very much about adventure, very much much about exploring, and of course that takes us back to the very origins of sailing, um, and it's become a sport in more recent history. Um, but I think it's very important that we don't lose the um, that original perspective um, and the you know just the very the vehicle of of using sailing and sailboats and any boat for that matter to get out in the water uh, brings us in contact with nature in, in very special ways. So, um, so yeah, that's uh, this is just um, where I grew up. So this is Southwest Ireland, Kerry, and maybe that larger photo there might be uh, recognizable to some of the star. Star Wars fans out there because in fact they use Skellig Michael um, for one of the more recent um, 
films, um, but those steps are real. This is a very special uh, UNESCO heritage site. Um, it's an old monastery and that was literally just off the coast. Um, and then the smaller photos inset are just photos of my brother, my, uh, and my dad or myself uh, sailing our dinghy and the farm uh, that went right down to the water's edge. And I guess what I'm just trying to represent here is we grew up, I guess, surrounded and embedded in nature. Um, you take it for granted. I don't mean that in a negative way. I just think it's just inherent in the way you, you are and you feel. And so sort of certainly I know that I've taken that culture with me as I've, um, as I've, uh, as uh, you know, through my life. And um, it's been, uh, it's very inherent in, in what I do, the way I interact with my family and, um, and it's embodies very much the values that I am, that I think um, both Alexandra has shared and, and uh, certainly that um, I've taken with me. And, and it, in some ways, I think when we think about resilience and the modern kind of interpretation of resilience and the, and the, the, the word that the way it's being used in sustainability, I think, you know, ha being embedded in nature is, is very important. And we've got a lot, a lot of lessons to learn going and to take um, with us going forward. So, um, yes, I think from here we, you know, I moved on into sailing and spent um, a few years in the UK and then spent seven years. Uh, I like to say I kind of grew up in Ireland and finished and growing up in the Caribbean. I spent seven years in the Caribbean and then went into um, into the competitive sport of sailing. So. Um, maybe back to Alexandra for her next step in your voyage. <laughs> I was thinking about steps, Damien. I thought maybe uh, I, I should set you guys the challenge of getting me to the top of those steps. Uh, uh, one. <laughs> you're on. Um, <laughs> fair play. So, um, so basically, when I had my accident, my, my actual uh, relationship with the waters is, is quite a sort of ironic, um, slightly uh, lo loaded kind of relationship because I had a diving, a shallow diving accident, um, as I said, when I was, when I was 13. So, um, so actually, really, I should have complete and utter fear and probably a level of contempt for, for the sea and for beaches. But um, actually, it turns out I love them and I love being on the water. And I think I very much miss kind of um, for years because I didn't, wasn't involved in any sort of real sport um, kind of post my injury. I just dibbled and dabbled. I, I really missed that feeling of being able to, to kind of be out in nature and, and sailing when I was offered the opportunity because I was recruited to compete, which happens a lot in the Paralympics. Um, the RY gave me this opportunity to be able to go out and I thought, wow, this is amazing, you know, I, here it is, there's a sport which I can be out in nature again, I can be on the water, like the place that I love, and also I can compete, you know, on a, essentially on a level playing field against able-bodied people, which is really the only sport that, that offered that opportunity. And I ended up going through three Paralympic cycles um, with Nikki Beryl, who is, uh, was my sailing partner for that entire time, so over a 10-year period. Um, the pictures are so that uh, in Beijing things didn't go quite right. Uh, London, they didn't go quite right in London. They didn't go quite right in Rio, for that matter. However, um, we came out with two medals because uh, in London at uh, a home game, which is in the top left corner, um, that's us on the podium in Weymouth and Portland, and in the bottom right corner, that's us uh, getting a bronze medal in Rio. And Throughout that experience, I guess uh, the things that, you know, especially today, since we're talking about leadership and, and a vision and our goals, is that the key things in, you know, in any athletic campaign, as well as also, I guess I learned it even earlier than that because of my injury in rehab, was very much about being goal oriented, you know, looking at the sort of bigger picture. And, you know, the dreaming component of actually, you know, what do I want to achieve? And then the small steps for us to get there. And then, you know, Damien, you touched on the point of resilience, which is a key aspect of anybody who's working in sustainability, but also as an athlete, it's a huge portion, you know, whether offshore is hugely important, 
but it's also uh, important, you know, for inshore racing when you're running an Olympic campaign and you're having to push yourself to get out of bed every single day to, you know, for what is four years down the road. Um, and in, and in, the, in the case of this year, it's actually five years down the road. But I think, um, and so really, it's really interesting that, you know, my athletic career has actually really prepared me to going back into sustainability work, you know, once I've transitioned. And the learnings from that have really prepared me to be able to, I think, take on the challenges that, that sustainability sort of offers in our, in our modern world at the moment. Um, we go to Alexander, the, how did you, how did you so, so did the sailing come first or the sustainability come first? Because I think you've got a degree in ecology or um, a, a similar. Yeah. So I, yeah, so I have a master's in environmental science and policy. So the, the environmental side really came first. Um, you know, that was the basis. And I think, you know, I, and, and I guess that's a really interesting point actually is, you know, the winning at all costs, you know, so you go into an Olympic campaign, it's all about, you know, that gold medal, you're trying to get, you know, you're trying to get a medal, you're trying to get that gold medal, the dream. And the reality is that, you know, performance is everything. And I think even when I may be brought to the fore, some of my kind of concerns, with relation to how we ran a, ran a campaign, you know, and whether that was about, you know, travel wasn't really an option for us to exclude, but, you know, things around, well, we could have zeroed our carbon and um, looking for sponsors and, you know, various other aspects. Um, I don't think it was very necessarily embraced, <laughs> um, you know, when I put it to the fore. And it's really interesting because the post Rio existence um is completely different you know the rio olympics i guess you could flick to the the next slide which that's us in the boat in in london and then uh if you go over one more we have a bit of video footage with which was filmed during training in rio um now rio was a really interesting game uh <laughs> for the olympics and paralympics uh the water quality in the bay is awful um Several people got ill. Uh, you know, we turned up multiple times and there were dead fish just floating all over the place, animals, you know, things got caught on your keel. We knocked off several rudders just because there was so much rubbish in the water. And it was really an opportunity for all of the sailors to, to grasp the realities of what was going on, you know, because in that bay, we could see everything that was happening really throughout the world. You know, it was the first developing nation, you know, a game. Uh, the, the government there had much higher priorities in terms of just being able to deliver education and health, you know, and so environment was pretty far down the list. And, and the realities for all of the athletes who came out of there was really apparent. And now we're seeing this huge evolution in terms of athletes getting really involved and being, um, and really pushing things forward, as well as the fact that we're also seeing, you know, world sailing. Um, so, uh, once I transitioned, I started working for a consultancy. And so one of the things that, you know, at Earth to Ocean that we delivered was world sailing sustainability um, strategy. And also now I work with uh, Sail GP as their in-house manager of sustainability. And we've also worked alongside world sailing to, de to deliver their sustainability um, for, for special events. So the sustainability charter. And I think now we're starting to see those evolutions at the higher leadership levels, but also right from the grassroots level, you know, and you know, there's been a big push on plastics, but I think actually people are just starting to realize the bigger picture and the fact that all of this is interlinked to climate change. And, um, you know, and I think if it weren't for Rio, I think a lot of people, I can definitely say from the Olympics fair that people wouldn't have even realized that this was going on. Alexandra on the end, so I'll just go back to the Rio piece. Um, I think I asked you this earlier on, whether that was a good or a bad thing, they didn't move you up to Buzios. Um, obviously, sailing out of Buzios would have been a lot nicer than <laughs> Rio from the sailing perspective, but it sounds like there was a very positive knock-on effect. And like, you know, when we see, so it sounds like you were directly involved in the Agenda 2030 for World Sailing, which is uh, really a kind of a, 
a standard in sustainability in sport and certainly in our sport. Uh, so congratulations on that. But it seems like that was kind of a knock on from the, in some ways, from the games being in in um, in Rio and not in Buzios. And um, and just to be clear, that's a, a very pristine, quite clean um, uh, environment just up the coast from Rio, right? So it would have been a training venue for many sailors. Um, and at the time, the question was, should the whole event sailing event at least be moved up there yeah well i know that um so i wasn't personally involved in 2030 because i had just whatever but um my boss was uh key to that delivery however um yes i mean i know world sailing uh, had you know went back and forth with the ioc a lot about moving the venue you know and the reality was that the media component of it you know the shots of christ and of sugarloaf kind of were more seen as more vital and important and keeping it within the city. Yeah. And, and, you know, and the, the reality is that it, you know, it did look cool. Like, you know, it's a beautiful place to sail. Um, and I think, you know, and the, but the flip side was that all of us were going out to race courses with our faces covered. And, you know, if you're, you know, you didn't want to fall into that water. That was well before COVID, right? <laughs> exactly, well before COVID. We were drinking Coca-Cola just to clean our systems after racing. And so I think the, you know, but the spin-off, as you say, actually has been huge, you know, and I think it's really motivated a huge amount of change in sailing as a sport and actually um, has put us really very much at the forefront of sports in terms of starting to, really make big changes around sustainability and actually looking at how what impact do we have so the, the um i might just it's kind of segue on there because the ocean yeah. race and, and sailing into rio is something that our you know sailing in that area area is something that we've uh, we've had rio as a stopover um on uh, more than a couple of occasions and i always find that that transition from the ocean, the kind of blue, green, gray existence of being on the ocean and in, literally, you know, like immersed in nature, uh, even in the context of competition, um, it's all around you. So you can't really, um, you know, you, it's, uh, it's part of what you're doing. You're trying to harness nature's elements to achieve a, a specific goal and to achieve optimum performance and excellence at all times. So, um, it's uh, it's sport embedded in nature, um, I guess, um, and then that transition from the from the ocean to to um, to to the land, and you know seeing you know arriving in places like Rio, like Miami, or any city really um, on the uh, on the on the shore, and seeing the human impacts, and of course you know unfortunately Rio, beautiful place, but has um, these significant impacts and. Um, I think some of the first thoughts I had when um, when I saw some of these bigger cities on the water coming from where I came and never having really seen uh, a, a waterfront city apart from maybe Cork or Galway um, is, you know, how does that all work? Because growing up, food came from the ocean or the farm. And, you know, so you could see literally or, you know, you were responsible for pulling the food on your own plate. And I think that connection with our own food source is something that's been lost and obviously is very very important in terms of understanding sustainability from a, a global context but you know when I looked at cities like that I was like where, how does that work where do all those resources come from um, but that was really I guess mid journey for me I've been involved in um, many sailing disciplines um, uh, like I said I, I um, spent seven years in the Caribbean and then was in contact with um, ocean racing, seeing the Route de Rome arrive into St. Bart's with uh, Florence Artaud's beautiful Groupier Premier, or silver turquoise trimaran, and all the others who came in behind her because she won the race. I was like, that's where it's at. I've got to, I've got to get involved in that. And um, and funnily enough, through a, quite a kind of a roundabout way, I got involved with international racing. Um, did the Pineapple Cup into Jamaica. I think I mentioned that yesterday, and uh, Kenwood Cup and a lot of the kind of Grand Prix races and eventually um, ended moving to France to get involved in shorthanded sailing because I very, want, want, very much wanted to um, be involved in all disciplines of, sa of sailing. And so crude racing is fantastic, but 
it's um, in some ways it's very much about being specialist. Um, whereas um, offshore sailing and especially short-handed sailing was a discipline which required you to be specialist in everything really. Um, and so I spent three years racing on the short-handed, single-handed Figaro circuit in France uh, and then making a transition to the Trime Run circuit and ending up back in the, um, back in the West, you know, doing transatlantics. Um, the ocean race, uh, it uh, comes around every three or four years and uh, I think I'm on my sixth or seventh uh, transitioning from sailor to now sustainability program manager for uh, our racing team. Uh, and so I've sort of seen the um, offshore and kind of the upper end of the offshore sport uh, from all um, from all ends of the boat, the front end and the back end. And all, I guess, the inherent challenges um, that we um, are thrown um, as athletes and sailors and teams. And um, and when I say a team, we, we always think about the sailors, but I think it's very important to consider the sport and a team um, in its entirety. Um, and when we think about a team of six to 10 people on a boat behind that group uh, of athletes, there's um, 10, 20 um, shore team from administration through to technicians. Um, and of course, then um, uh, all of the suppliers and the, um, the, the stakeholders involved in the periphery of the team. So it's a, it's a huge undertaking. And um, when I say I have six or seven Volvos, I guess that probably means um, best part of 25 years of my life working in, in this arena. Um, and what's been very obvious, I guess, is, you know, when we look at those different challenges and Alexander, you'll have come up against many um, in your Olympic career. Um, it's, I think it's a, it's a good time to consider whether it's about the goal and standing on the podium with a medal uh, or whether it's about the voyage and how you overcome those challenges. So I don't know if it might be a good moment for you to jump in and, you know, maybe now with a bit of hindsight, um, do you think it's more important to stand on the podium with the medal or to consider that the journey is just as important, if not more important? Um, I think the, the journey is more important. I think, um, you know, for like, you know, running any campaign is, is incredibly challenging. Um, and I think looking back, like I didn't enjoy the, the four years into Rio um you know i found it really uh i knew i had to retire and i think um and that, that was part of the thing so i really didn't enjoy you know i obviously i was happy i came out with a medal and i was relieved i came out with a medal but did i you know do i value that medal as much as i value london i i don't and one of the main reasons is because the four years into london was just it's so much more of an enjoyable campaign you know i really loved what i was doing and um yeah, it just doesn't have the same value. I think yeah. at, at the end of the day, you look back and you you know it's not as important. Uh, yeah, I think I think um, from my perspective, I think especially early on, probably as a younger person as well, you know, you know, your soul, this image of soul. Your, I mean, maybe it's just inherent in the way we um, approach competition. Um, but the notion that winning at all costs is is something that's um that we should aspire to and it's a, a sort of modus operandum that um that we overcome ob all obstacles in whatever way we can to achieve our goals um, um uh, i sort of I, I think you know when you're you know when you're in the heat of competition um it's important to consider the philosophy and the ethics of what you're doing and that's I think in hindsight probably even more important and it's probably easier either even easier to consider those in hindsight but it's probably also inherent in what we need to do in terms of laying out our vision right so yeah. you need to first of all define what that vision is is it getting to the podium um, at all costs um, or do we need to consider um, the the journey to to get there um, and the um, potential collateral damage associated with it. So uh, I think you know when we look at something like sailing, um, we have you know ultimately success success comes in many different colours. Um, this was us in the last campaign, where in one of the legs we lost a we lost a rig and ended up putting a jury rig on the boat in the Falkland Islands. 
and ultimately getting back into the race, um, which allowed us to finish the overall event and, and, and get a and get a good result. Um, the overall success of the campaign, in other in many ways, was defined by successes not just on the water but off the water. And I think that's something that we need to consider as athletes and teams as well. What um, you know, defining this this vision of of success. So maybe we can have a look at that a little bit more. How did you guys manage your relationships with stakeholders and expectations and partners and sponsors and suppliers? Uh, for, well, we didn't have that many. <laughs> um, so, uh, but I think um, uh, we just, we tried to, yeah, the reality is that in Olympic sailing, it's really hard to get money out of anybody, um, support kind of your dream. But I think, uh, you know, so we crowdfunded a lot, uh, a lot of stuff and that you know and i think that that was most important actually because it meant that we were taking people who really cared about us on the same journey right. and you know which was important and i guess my question to you is you know looking at that photo is you know in terms of the campaigns that you've run for you know for the the ocean race um you know do you think that was that campaign in in many ways kind of one that you you value the most in terms of or not? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> now that's a great question. And, um, I, you know, I think well before a kind of a more complete comp uh, kind of realization from my part as an athlete, I always understood the fact that there were races that I won or did really well in, uh, and I was dissatisfied with the performance. Um, and there were performances that I achieved uh, without a podium result uh, that I was totally happy with. Uh, and maybe that's part of sailing because we're not in full control of every, um, of every event. It's maybe more about the average. Um, but, you know, even just taking one event, um, there are many races where I didn't get anywhere near the podium, but knew I'd performed extremely well and was very very happy with uh, the way things went and um, and there were times when I would have won a race and and just felt I could have done better or uh, I'd made a horrible mistake on the water which I shouldn't have made so um, this specific event uh, it was a new one for me because I was both sailing and uh, taking on the management of the sustainability program for the team for that 12-month campaign and it's allowed me for the first time specifically to um, take my learnings. I previously worked for the Canadian Wildlife Federation as education manager for six years and embeddings um, nature and nature connection into education um, in parallel with working with other organizations like Oman Sail and, and other organizations that were um, considering the broader context of what sailing and the sailing platform um, can provide. Um, to their stakeholders, but this is the first time that we were really um, focusing on embedding sustainability throughout the campaign and it was a great challenge. It was uh, and it was something that I guess has started a, has cons consolidated or solidified, I guess, a journey and um, that we are now all undertaking and, you know, I think we're all very proud as a team to have flown those colors um, for Vestas and 11th Hour Racing and to now move on to the next campaign, which is 11th Hour Racing team entering the ocean race. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, it, it very much comes back to, again, these core, these core values. And I thought maybe it'd be interesting to explore some of those with you because post the games, I guess you've gone on to doing other work and back into the sustainability space and using sailing in different ways rather than the search just the search for a medal congratulations on that by the way yeah. <laughs> uh cheers yeah so um so sort of the the i after i transitioned out of sailing in 2016 at the same time uh ben ainsley uh was running his america's cup campaign uh ben ainsley racing which was the gb challenger and um there was a sustainability focus that was the focus of, of that campaign and um, so I figured that the best way to kind of combine 
10 years of experience in sport alongside my environmental um, background was to stalk the head of, the of their sustainability program and see if I could get some work experience or a job. And um, uh, uh, her name was Susie Thompson and she was just leaving uh, um, Ben Ainsley Racing. And so she said to me, why don't you come and just do some work for me um, at my consultancy and, you know, and see how you feel about you know, what your next moves are gonna be. And um, so three years later, I'm still doing work uh, with her, alongside her. And, um, and as I said, I'm now working for Cell GP, which is, a, is an evolution out of the last America's Cup and is a global racing series with the fastest race boats on Earth. And so it's like F1 on water, it's a bit, it's crackers, um, which, you know, has been a big undertaking and a, a steep learning curve in terms of how do you deliver a global sports event, you know, that's a moving to different places with different resources. Um, alongside that, um, I've also had, a, you know, several opportunities to, to do different things. And, and the photo that um, I chose to have you put up was, is this really cool project in, in London. Because I guess one of the conversations that, that we've had is kind of about, you know, the extended reach of of sailing and of, of water sports, I guess, in some ways, and in terms of that whole value system. And um, this boat is called Polymer, as you can see. Um, what's cool about it is it's been made from recycled, um, it's made from plaswood, which is recycled plastic and, and sawdust waste, basically. Uh, it's got a torpedo electric uh, outboard on the back of it. And what's really amazing about this project is run by Docklands Water Sports Center alongside uh, a cad an academy, a preschool in, in the Docklands area of London, which is not particularly, a you know, it's quite a low income area, though, you know, most of uh, the UK's money probably passed and half of the world's money probably passes through the big buildings in that area. The actual area is fully surrounded by water by the Thames and the school has run this phenomenal program where they teach kids how to swim. And then once they get those water skills, they go on to sailing and then they go on to kayaking in the following year. So they do a year on year program. And then wrapped up within that, they've done this thing which is called plastic fishing alongside um, Hubbub, which is a, is a um, NGO in the UK. And, and so you literally go on this boat and you go out and you fish plastic out of um, out of the waters of the Thames and around the Docklands area. And all of the kids who were also out with us that day, um, they do all of the sorting of all of the waste so they can understand exactly what's recyclable, what's not, um, and their appreciation for their, their local waterways. And, and these are kids who, you know, may not have even learned how to swim, you know, much less be able to sail or kayak or, you know, and actually the delivery of, you know, a program like this makes all the difference and and I think uh, in terms of setting those values and that vision of what else we can deliver uh, as sports as a whole uh, but you know more specifically as sailing as, as a water sport you know being able to be involved in projects like this are you know a phenomenal opportunity and I know that you you guys are doing a lot of that alongside your delivery um, as one of the ocean race teams Damien. Yeah, I guess, you know, that speaks very much to the social side of, of sailing, right? And, um, and uh, I mean, this is a very similar, I guess, approach. This was um, the time that uh, during a period I was working for the Canadian Wildlife Federation in Canada and again in a, in a community which, was, um, which had the amazing support of this very dynamic teacher um, who basically put them through a boat building program and started from scratch and and uh, they built their own mirror dinghies and again I guess, I guess I guess it just reaches back to this conversation that we're having around the multidisciplinary multi-generational aspect of of our sport and coming back to those core values and that work was very much about making connections with nature and establishing those core values um, for as part of life's learning and and as as part of um, you know embedding those values for for all going forward, um, what was very obvious in in my work there was the realization that 
unlike myself, most, you know, growing up in Southwest Ireland, um, and anyone who's still who's still living there or still growing up there is, you know, it's a very unique opportunity, which, to be honest, the larger percentage of the world's population doesn't have. And so this, therein lies the challenge, but also the responsibility and, op and opportunity, I think, for sailing and for sailors to consider this paradigm shift that we're talking about of sort of winning at all costs. And um, I think, you know, sport and excelling in sport and business and life is, uh, and those, those um, core values are hugely important, but we need to consider the broader context of, of what that means. So uh, this is a great conversation. I think we're going to be doing a second edition. So, but maybe should we have a look at how we've started to approach that from the 11th hour racing team's perspective? Yeah, it would be great to, to get a bit of a breakdown, have a look. Um, there we go. I think the starting point really, I think, and, and I think we'll all recognize this, and Ellen MacArthur did an amazing job quite a few years ago of um, presenting the minimalistic approach of sailing in terms of once the boat leaves the dock, you have a, your world is, is the, uh, the bow, from, goes from the bow to the stern of the boat. Um, and it sets very specific boundaries within which we must live and and survive for the time we're at sea. Um, and so that's uh, that's you know very clear. And I, you know you know even from a, I'd imagine from a a short course perspective, you know within race rules, you're that's the same approach, right? You're you leave the dock with a set of sails, and and um, you have to achieve a certain performance before you before you come back to the dock with some specific rules and parameters and and you can't you know you can't get outside help um and um it's it's very much about living with what we have and so scaling that up to uh, community level regional level national level or global level is i guess really what we need to achieve any have you any perspectives on that alexander i uh, yeah, I do. I mean, I guess I do to some degree. It's, um, yes, you know, it's slightly easier leaving a dock for four hours rather than like 28 days. Um, however, however, I think, um, you know, the, for us, um, a huge aspect of that is, is kind of, and I know we'll touch on it in a bit, is very much kind of the, the, what we're actually using to build our boats and how are we actually using those various things on the water. Um, and, and that's really a, a big focus of, I guess, where Olympic sailing will be going and, you know, and, and actually just casual boating, you know, like you go into any boatyard across the world and you'll just see a bunch of boats dump, dumped off that, you know, don't get used and they're made out of composites and various other things, but um, let's wait and let's go into that, dig into that a little bit later. Yeah, I think obviously when we that's 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 a great segue because when we look at these images, we you know we recognise the finite resources element of being offshore, but of course, what we need to do now as a sport of sailing is look beyond things like a little bit of you know, not so I don't mean to say a little bit, but you know, ocean plastics and single-use plastic bottles hugely important, but now we need to look at the bigger picture, like how are we going out there in the first place? With what resources are we using? Where do these boats, materials, supplies come from? Uh, and we need to take a much more comprehensive approach to what we're doing. Um, Gerrit, is this a good time to maybe give an opportunity for any questions, or will we flow through into the next phase? Yeah, I'm. I'm just aware. I'm just aware of the time. Um, uh, well, yeah. We're just having a great conversation here. What What we can probably do? There's one question coming in, but what we can probably do is uh, talk for like two or three minutes about this this compass, this circle, which I think makes a lot of sense in the context that we're talking about. And then and then we'll take some questions and trying to wrap up in in about ten minutes. Cool. That sounds good. I mean, so basically, what we're looking at here is. Moving from the last campaign, the Vetsis 11th hour racing campaign for the Volvo Ocean Race into um, our next project, which is with the 11th hour racing team. And um, it's a three year program entering the next ocean race. And we have mo now we have time. We have time to look at the entirety of what we're doing. 
to consider um, the full scope and boundaries of our responsibility to move beyond just um, the easy ticket items like single-use plastic on board or ashore uh, to some of the more difficult problems and Alexander just mentioned one which of course is the manufacturing of products and boats specifically and so we've taken a sort of a top-down bottom-up approach where we've um, just assigned for um, sort of key, four pr key principles that we consider are important, leadership, um, innovation. And I'd just like to talk about innovation for a minute because any sailor, we're, we're a technical sport, we're reliant on technology and innovation. Um, and inherent to what we do, whether we're racing or just tinkering about on the boats on the weekend without any competition involved, we're innovating and looking at ways of improving our, our boat. It's what we do. Um, and 110% of that, of that sort of gray matter, if you like, has been focused on performance to date. What we now need to do is take that amazing capacity that we have as sailors um, and apply it, even just a small percentage of it, to, to sustainable um, options and solutions. And so taking some of our challenges and finding real solutions for them. So we consider that to be very, very important. And, um, and the best place to start with that, of course, is collaborating with the stakeholders in the industry, whether it's suppliers or manufacturers um, as, as key examples. Um, we also recognize that as a team, we're very um, lucky to have the, um, the partnership with 11th Hour Racing. Um, and therefore, we want to make sure that the pathway that we're taking uh, we can leave as a we can leave a template as a legacy for other teams and organisations, and so we're uh, as well as creating our own comprehensive sustainability program, where our objective is to leave a pathway which is replicable and scalable for others, whether it's just a mum and dad taking their kids around to some sailing lakes or full-on um, professional teams. Uh, and so that's the approach we've taken, which is really embedded embedding sustainability. Uh, from the economic, social, and environmental perspective into everything we do. Um, and so that's the, that's the starting point. Um, Alexandra, you'll certainly recognize all or much of that. It's a very process, I'm sure, if you apply to everything you're doing. Is there anything? Uh, yeah, so, no, so across the board, I think that, that you know, it's quite a standardized uh, way in, in which we approach things on the work that I'm doing, you know, uh, at Sail GP, um, you know, as part of our solution, but also it's, you know, it's very much what we would look at in terms of just delivering a, a campaign as a whole, but it's just a different skew, you know, you're looking through a different lens when you're doing it in this way. Um, and I guess the only other thing I could say is that, you know, uh, as Damien mentioned, like uh, sailors are innovators and use a lot of technology, um, you know, for what I had to do, you know, as a Paralympic sailor to be able to utilize a boat, you have to figure out how you're going to get somebody on the water. So that shows you the level of innovation. Like, you know, my seat was just like a magical carbon thing, which did phenomenal stuff. But the, the realities are that we can use that ingenuity to be able to solve the problems. And, you know, and also use, I, I think, you know, from a personal perspective, use more disabled people to also help with the, that problem solving, because the reality is that that's, that's everyday life for, for disabled people. So I think we have an opportunity as a sport really to increase our diversity and, and kind of, and get more inclusivity kind of going. Um, so Damien, out here you've outlined the goals, which sort of are some of the breakdown of those compass points. Um, and I, I guess I, I found, found three of them really, really interesting. And if you could just open them up a little bit, because obviously I know we're running low on time. Um, so within innovation, like transforming manufacturing, I thought that that was really important, you know, for every, in, you know, from every aspect of life. Yeah, I mean, I think probably you can do, probably you can pick one and we leave the other ones for, okay. for yeah. the next uh, edition to just <laughs> pick up here again and allow some time for questions. But why don't you just pick one and, and kind of give a teaser for, for next Sounds one? Sounds good. Yeah, no, I mean, as I've said, this is really much the kind of compass that we go by for our sustainability yeah. program, uh, which is broken down into a whole matrix of 74 goals and many others that don't even get written down or just actioned. Um, but in, in this case, we're talking about transforming manufacturing, which I think is very clearly looking at the elephant in the room at the end of the day. We're a, technic we're a technological based sport 
uh, where whilst we have this green blue image where the best parallel we can draw is with uh, motorsport um, we need machines to go and compete on and um, you know how those machines how those boats and that all the material and the sails um, and uh, components that we need on the water are manufactured and supplied to us uh, they're the questions we need to ask and so the starting point for us was really reaching out defining who what we were doing um, who the stakeholders were which suppliers we were going to be working with and reaching out to those suppliers um, so that we could assess where the risks and, and challenges and opportunities were and so we started by doing that uh, with our internal group um, by nature i guess we're uh, quite a diverse group because we've got uh, we're a multinational team and uh, still growing so hopefully we can keep to work on keep working on that uh, we consider that it sort of you know the extended team goes beyond just the athletes and the and the team members themselves but out to the extended family members so it, it's an amazing network of of uh, of people that we have to reach out to to help us build out our core uh, goals and then of course our primary sponsors and partners like 11th hour racing hugely important um, and so defining what we're doing and looking at the issues that we're going to be working with um, together um, when we think about manufacturing boats of course you know if we're building a boat if we're buying a boat if we're building components where are they coming from and so we have a classification process whereby we consider our stakeholders we consider their influence um, and their um, their interest in the issues uh, which defines their level of importance with us and so uh, clearly there's an econo economic element as well there so if we're spending a lot of money with one supplier we'll certainly want to be trying to focus with them on common areas so we'll ask them are there are they already working in the sustainability space what are their challenges how can we limit our overall footprint um, in through our purchasing of, of produces of, of products or suppliers or, or services with them and um, you know how can we help them with some of the challenges that they want to address um, and so it's a it's very much a collaborative process and when we think about manufacturing um, manufacturing a boat manufacturing a carbon boat um, for the ocean race or any component like that we need to look at um, you know what type of uh, products are being used um, how they're being made what are the processes involved and so it's a whole supply chain supply chain which which goes through hundreds and thousands of components and so that's the type of a process that we're looking at as we approach the preparation for the race um, and it's it's very very exhaustive and so part of that is using LCA tools to uh, take into account the life cycle analysis of various components that we will be purchasing or building um, and then of course I know um, Alexandra you've talked to me about the importance of communication and I think that's you know hugely important in all of these spaces but especially when we look at the bottom left hand side there and reaching out to marine communities and peers and and uh, you know public and 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 fans so um that's uh that's something that you've, you've you've asked me about so i don't know if you've any comments there um well i think it's something that we'll probably i think we should explore a bit more next time uh because i think it's it's a huge open space and it'd be good to get some some questions in um geert have we, um, yeah. when we're thinking about reaching out to stakeholders, you had a couple of comments there, and is there is there anything you wanted to share with us? Well, I mean, uh, there's a lot of things I could share, uh, I think as well. But thank you, thank you very much. And again, uh, we we kind of we're kind of only halfway through all of the things that we'd like to uh, like to share, and we'll kind of we'll continue that in the next seminar uh, next next Thursday. Um, but instead of instead of sharing my insight, I would like probably just to take at least at least one or two questions from uh, the, the people in the audience. And, and this one, it's, it's a massive topic, but I, I just don't, I still want to mention it from David Johnson, who says, it would be interesting to see what opportunities that you see in the huge problem of COVID-19. It has disrupted everything. It causes us to rethink so many things. How might sailing and competition change for the better from what we are learning as we are going through the pandemic? So. Any thoughts on that? How is our world changing? How is our approach take, changing? How is sailing changing and winning? 
Alexandra, do you want to start? <laughs> All right. Um, well, it's a good thing you said this because I had a bit of a thought about this. Um, so I guess the thing is that, you know, especially looking at from the leadership context, is that you know very tough decisions are being made at the moment you know we're having to make really hard and fast decisions you know our, our leaders are having to do that and i guess um in the same way we need to apply that to our environment is the way i was kind of looking at it and you know and also individually how are we going to each make a difference um you know within the constraints circumstances that we're going to be existing in, you know, especially economically, that's going to have huge implications in, in the coming year, really. And I think um, we just have to start to really, on an individual basis, start to look at things differently, you know, and the sports are going to have to, and, and the leadership within each of our sports is going to have to step up and really make a change towards toward that new winning and, and see it as an op opportunity more than anything else. Because I think that, you know, we've all realized from COVID and I know I, this has been said hundreds of times is the fact is that, you know, environmental changes that we needed to have made, you know, 10 years ago, we managed to do overnight. Everybody stopped flying. Everybody's, you know, stopped driving around the place, you know, and actually those are all things that we've wanted, you know, can we, all be sitting on webinars and having our meetings online. Well, actually, yes, we've now discovered that we can do all of those things. And sport is going to have to see the next evolution, you know, in terms of actually how are we going to start delivering sporting events and, and you know, what does that look like? Um, but I think it's just that we have to expand the way in which we look and, and, and really think outside of the box a lot more than we used to. You know, and I think everything that seemed impossible before we're now recognizing that there might be ways around it and there, there are problems that we can definitely solve. So I'm, yeah, I'm a big fan of, of the innovation arm uh, when we were talking about that, about innovation and technology, because I think, I'm not saying that's gonna be the savior, but I think that that's gonna be very key to that delivery. Hopefully that's answered the question in a roundabout way. <laughs> yeah, I think I can sort of feed into that maybe just by, it sounds like what you're talking about, Alexandra, is really just shifting from token gestures of sustainability um, to a more comprehensive understanding and acknowledgement of our larger responsibilities and you know obviously travel and you know the type of boats that we're sailing in the type of events that we're competing in and you know even you know down to the very fundamental redefinition of what success means and what winning means um, and it's probably not just about the um, um, the end goal or end medal. It's about um, a successful journey um, promoting um, healthy social communities and um, sustainable um, sport um, within a healthy environment. And so um, I think we need to look at sport and look at what we're doing through a, a very different lens and take responsibility for the entirety of what we're doing. I think we all understand now, you know, even my kids, um, you know, and kids should generally are learning about it at school, are very, very aware of teaching their parents and their grandparents. We all know the why. Um, now we need to be able to uh, understand and share the how. And that's, I think, what we need to explore in the next edition, right? Yeah, very much so. Exactly. So I think that is that is a great way. And, and, and again, we could keep talking and especially when we start talking about sailing with, with Alexandra and Damien, they, uh, I think they can keep going until it's dark here. But I, I want to respect everyone's time. And, and on the note, like what is when it's about the how um, we will we will publish uh, the slides and some additional resources that were made available through uh, a portal sustainability.sport that's been launched earlier this week together with uh, the, the guides organization. So there is a clear collection of resources there available if you're wondering like how to actually approach this topic. And I know there's a lot of people who are on this call that are not from the sailing industry. Um, so um, I, I think whether you're from sailing industry or not, I think the approach to a lot of things is similar. You just have to translate certain vocabulary certain uh, a boat into a bowl for example um, or a car 
etc. And that's what we want to talk about next uh, next week, where we really want to go more into detail of like, okay, now Damien switches hat. He doesn't speak as sailor anymore, although I don't think you ever get that out of him. But he's a sustainability manager, and you're working in the organization. Where do you start? How do you start? What are the steps to actually embed? this approach that we've been talking about in the last hour in your organization. So we go into those details next, uh, next week. So please do join us next week, next Thursday, same time, same place uh, for part two of this, uh, this webinar. I want to give the last word to you, uh, to you too, Alexandra, Damien, if there's any final things you want to give away or something to think about in the week ahead of us, uh, this is your chance. Go ahead, Damon. I'll let you kick oh, I thought you were going to sign off. <laughs> <laughs> now, for me, it's very much about um, it's I think it's very clearly about the journey and not about the destination. I think, um, yeah, I think we just need to use the, the sort of the learning that we're and the time that we've had with COVID to really uh, reconsider and and I think look through a different lens, as you pointed out. So actually really um, think hard about yeah what our next steps are and don't rush it frankly we there's an urgent need to change something but we also don't need to rush it we need to think before we start running yeah um, yeah so those are uh, those are wise words i think to finish on this call so thank you very much again uh feel free to uh to kind of check out our website or the sustainable sport tour in the meantime if you want to look for specific resources but thank you so much alexandra and damien for sharing your insights with us and thank you all for for listening uh, and then asking the questions and um, i wish you a great week and looking forward to seeing you again in a week from now have a good day bye bye uh, bye everybody bye